You too, Mo's Nose fam. What's going on? Welcome to Mo's Nose. I'm your host, Mo's. Today, we continue in our 32 team mock draft series. We are on episode 30. That means we're almost done. Can you believe next week, starting Thursday, the 28th, begins the 2022 NFL draft? This is one of my favorite episodes in the series, and I could assume you all know why. We headed to San Francisco. Y'all see it in the back. Y'all know who I'm rocking with. I make it clear where my allegiance is live, but we're going to San Francisco. Uh, we're going to do a full seven round mock draft for my San Francisco 49, but I'm not doing it by myself. I could, I love to, not doing it by myself. I've done plenty of mock drafts for Nitty Gritty Niners. You've seen them over there. Go give us a, a shout over at Nitty Gritty Niners. Uh, follow us on the Patreon. I've done a couple on there, uh, but today I'm, I'm enlisting the help from one of the faithful, one of the members of the faithful. And this is special to me. Uh, two episodes in a row, uh, we got a fan on, but it's, it's more than a fan. I tell y'all, once y'all become a part of Mo's Nose family, I love you and there's nothing you can do about it. But today I got another member of my real family on, like blood cousin, like dude, this is family family. Grew up, I mean, when I found, I was a 49ers fan when I was a kid. I didn't know he was a 49ers fan. When I found out he was a 49ers fan, it was probably one of the happiest days of my life. Happiest days of my life. Cause I was like, good, I'm not alone. Like I got somebody in my family, like, yes, my big cousin, let's go. Like, one of the happiest days of my life. I'm gonna bring him on right now. My cousin, my man, Sid B. What's going on with you, Sid? Thanks for coming on. What's going on, Moses? How you doing? I'm good. I'm good, man. It, like I said, it's my cousin, his family, both 49er fans. Uh, believe it or not, man, this man used to babysit me when I was a kid. Uh, I, I I learned how to make sandwiches because of this, man. I was doing it all wrong. He showed me how to properly make a, a ham and cheese or a peanut butter and jelly sandwich when I was a young man. So uh, I, I, I owe a lot of my great sandwich making skills to this man right here. Uh, but I also owe a lot of my, my knowledge about the 49ers and and everything that you know this team has been through over the years through this man uh, again glad to have you on good to talk to you about 49ers and football as always uh, before we jump in you know to this mock draft we got two elephants in the locker room now you you, you leading the show today uh, i'm just moderating we can go wherever you want to go do we want to start with the jimmy elephant or you want to start with the debo elephant we let's address both of these elephants well it's uh it's 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 a challenge both are really big um i'd say we start with the jimmy elephant uh, because that is in my opinion um what's having the domino effect with the other elephant in the room in my opinion um and uh it, I know there are a lot of rumors out there. I know there's a lot of conversation out there, but for both elephants, um, but I'm just gonna start out and say, both situations, in my opinion, are about money. And with Jimmy, it's what's available in terms of the cap space. Um, and I don't think the 49ers have planned uh, to still have Jimmy on the roster in April. Uh, late April, particularly of this year. Um, and uh, that affects their ability to be dynamic, creative with the cap uh, in a year where their best offensive player, um, in my opinion, who deserves uh, the, the type of investment that the 49ers have made for other players like Jimmy, um, who at the time we offered him, you know, we offered to pay him and he'd be the most, uh, the, the most well-paid quarterback in the league after only, I think it was six games, seven games of performance. Um, and players see that. So when Debo is coming up for his amount of recognition, uh, those same players are going to see that precedent and want that for themselves. And in my opinion, relative to what Jimmy did, you know, Jimmy just performed well. Debo 
allowed this team to go deep into the playoffs and threw this team on his back offensively when the offensive line couldn't block well enough to sustain a run game when you know their limited quarterback decision maker wasn't able to get the ball to an open Brandon Ayuk game after game after game after game. He's the one who made it happen. So in my opinion, Debo saved not only the playoff run, but also helped cover for the 49er front office, in my opinion, struggles and decisions that they had made previously about different players, um, etc., to covering the injuries that obviously affected the offensive line uh, with uh, my boy uh, Mike Lynchy going out. And now you have, uh, you know, his replacement, really good at run blocking, but not really good at pass protection. Debo was the answer on the offense. He covered all of those things. Um, so I think he should have his due. And this is why, in my opinion, the Jimmy elephant trickles over into the Debo issue that's happening right now. Yeah, man, uh, you said it. Uh, my brother Breezy said it on, on a show that he did the other day. Um, the players see that and, you know, wanting to be paid, you know, top market we always hear the term reset the market um should Debo be one of those guys that reset the market absolutely because of what he's able to do on the field even if he doesn't want to be used as a running back because he wants to prolong his career the fact that you can use him that way and the fact that you can just put him in the back even if you don't hand him the ball if you put him in the backfield and the defense sees that threat that is another thing that they have to think about and we all know playing this game the less that you have to think about, the faster you can play. So the more things you give a defense to think about, to to digest in 10 to 15 seconds as they're looking at the formation pre-snap, the, the slower you allow them to be able to read and react. So um, the dynamic that he adds to any offense, um, and I think that's why you're, you're seeing teams, you know, making offers. Uh, we're hearing rumors that the Jets are willing to offer pick number 10. Uh, because they want a guy like that in their offensive scheme. And I think you hit the, the nail on the head perfectly. You know, Debo did everything that he needed to do to cover up for poor decision making. And if we're looking at going into next year, even if you're going into Trey Lance, and I think uh, most of the faithful believe that, you know, Trey Lance is the answer at quarterback and we need to see him and see what potential that he has, right? But Debo has to be thinking. He didn't get that much playing time as a rookie, even though he should have. And now he's going into year two as the full time starter. There are going to be growing pains. You know, if we had a quarterback who was in New England, who had a championship culture and was sitting behind Tom Brady, who still couldn't play up to that standard, we should still expect some type of growing pains with this young quarterback going into his first full season of starting. So in his mind, I'm still going to be utilized in those same ways because we we don't have a Tom Brady or an Aaron Rodgers at quarterback who can dictate everything from that position. We still have somebody who's learning. So if I'm going to be called on to do that much, I should be compensated as such. And I should be used in a way where I can remain healthy for all 18 weeks and a deep playoff run and not have to worry about nagging injury. So I completely agree with all of that. Um, they overplayed their hand with the Jimmy Garoppolo situation. Um, and now we are where we are. And if, if you hear Jimmy talk, he says, you know, we're still taking it day by day, but I'll be I'll be ready by training camp. And that's what we knew. I knew that he knew that I believe any team that was interested in him knew that. But they're not going to give the, the 49ers what they're asking for, knowing that they're going to get rid of this guy. Like, I don't understand why we're expecting or anticipating a team to give us what we want when they know that if it comes to a boiling point and we have to release them, they can get him without sacrificing assets. Like, what's your take on that? Like, the stubbornness of the front office. So, yeah, that that that's pretty interesting. I, I, I think they're set on a particular amount of compensation. And, 
you know, even even if they say no one offered us, no one made an official offer. Um, you know, I I I, I really I, I've been hearing a lot from the fan base, from the faithful, um, who kind of you know sit on the other side of this, who say, well, there's in both cases for Jimmy and for Debo, the the team never made an official offer or another team hasn't made an official offer for Jimmy or there's an official offer made for Debo. The the thing is that, as you know, teams talk all the time. Agents talk all the time to the team. You know, you know what the general range of what someone would be willing to offer. I mean, people just don't go into a, a conversation, a business conversation, with the official offer in the first in the first contact that they have uh, with, with with teams or with players. Um, so this whole thing, well, there was no official offer made, but that doesn't mean conversations haven't been had, right? Um, so I I, I I think that particularly for for the Jimmy situation, we overvalued him, and most teams do overvalue their their own players. We overvalued him as as a as a as a team, as an organization. And what what's interesting is that you know there's this there's this conversation. I think there there's this sort of conversation that's going on that's not connected. Right. On one hand. You know, we know as a team and even as a play designer, right? Kyle is actively hiding Jimmy. And I want to say hiding in the sense that Kyle's very good at as a play designer to take your strengths as a player on offense and force teams to deal with your strength, right? Versus your weaknesses. And we know that Kyle designs plays to make sure that Jimmy's strengths are brought to bear on any game plan and defense. And the only way you can beat the 49ers is by, by really taking away completely Jimmy's strengths. And that's hard to do. And you know, probably, well, that's easy. Well, it's kind of hard to do, particularly if you have more additional talent on offense like a deep series. You know, if fine, if you take away the middle of the field, right, that Jimmy loves to throw to, Kyle will hit you with uh, that edge zone read, right? He's, he's just going to keep it, keep feeding it to whoever can get out to the edge the fastest to, to force defenses to, to come away from uh, not just uh, loading up for the run, but also uh, in that, that like, 10 to 11 yard range that from the line of scrimmage that Jimmy loves to throw to over the middle. Constantly is going to, if you, if you take that away, Kyle's going to hit you in other places. Um, but I guess that's to, to answer the other part of your, your question. That's where I, I feel like the reason why we have to keep Debo Samuel, in my opinion, not just because he's a good player, because with Trey coming in as somewhat of a question mark, you have also your outside of Trent Williams, the rest of the offensive line is a question mark. And let's just be honest and say that, right? Because we don't know who's going to replace Tomlinson and do well, right? He was a really good player. Uh, Alex Mack hasn't confirmed that he's even coming back next year. We've all seen the issues that are going on with my boy. I love him, but I think he's playing out of position, Dan Brunskill. And then Compton went to Denver. And we have Mike McGlinchey coming back from a season-ending injury. That was a major, major issue. And I know he looked good in a lot of the videos that have come out uh, of him training, but still, that is not football. That is not on the field. So, you're going to need offensive talent to, in my opinion, even feel the competitive 11 on offense 
with a new quarterback in a new system. The more guys you have who know what's going on, who know how to challenge defenses, the easier it is going to be not just on our second year QB, but the rest of the offense. And, and, and I don't think people are really talking about the huge question marks we have going forward. You know, that that's out of that's five out of six of the offensive line in which we have questions about. That's just not gonna go away uh, up until game time, until we see these, whoever the five, where the rest of the four are going to be. Um, and, and I still have questions out about McGlinchey, how they're going to show up on that first Sunday. Um, and it's going to take whoever this group is time to gel. So I feel like a Debo keeping him on the team at least settles a lot of the questions that are big questions that are happening right now on this team. Um, and you know, to me that 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 pulls into that falls into as as I've said what we're seeing with Jimmy. Um, can we keep people? Can we pay them? All of that is hard to do and think creatively when the guy, you have a, 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 a $25 million, essentially right now, backup, still on the roster. Taking that. Yeah, yeah. You said it earlier. It, it's the domino effect. If, if he wasn't on the roster, maybe we're able to keep Tomlinson. So at least we know that that left side is good. If we got confirmation from Alex Mack, then that's three out of the five positions. Then we need to figure out that right guard. Is it Jalen Moore? Is it Aaron Banks? Um, you know, the, the question is still out on McGlinchey, but yeah, you, you have a thousand percent right with that. I mean, with those question marks on the offensive line, the Debo continues to be that that band-aid. He continues to be that that distraction because of what he can do with the ball in his hands, um, you really don't think about the weaknesses that are going to be on the offensive line or maybe even some of the early season struggles that we'll see from a second year quarterback um, in Trey Lance. And to me, I think that goes into his argument for why I want to be paid as such. Absolutely. I'm not just I'm not just relied on from a physicality um, of what I can actually produce on the field. I'm also being relied on for the intangible. I'm being relied on for the, the psychology of it all because my presence is going to allow teams to not focus on some of those weaknesses. So got a lot of questions that need to be answered. I don't know if we'll be able to answer them in the draft, but we are gonna try. We'll let you steer this shit now. We can do it two ways. We can do a, a draft straight through with the picks that we have and just leave it and go. Or we can do one where we, we do some trades. Maybe we try to move Jimmy. Maybe we try to move Debo. Which one do you want to do? You just want to go straight through or you want to see what we can do with some trades? Um, I Let's go straight through. Because okay. I, 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 I don't think the 49ers are going to... Me personally, I'd be shocked if they trade Debo. Um, just because I, I think that if that happens, um, Lynch and the front office are in a lot of trouble. They're, they're going to have to get a haul of picks. They're going to have to be wow, um, in my opinion. And, and I, I just can't, I, yes. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to finish with this and we can go to the picks. And this is kind of uh, sort of addressing something earlier you said about uh, resetting the market. I, it, to me, that talks about value, right? What is a player value? How, how is a player value? What's their value to you as a team and as a scheme? Right? We pay the most money for a fullback out of any team by a lot in the year, in the league. Why is that? because of his value to this scheme, right? No other team uses their fullback like we do. Same, I, I look at that in, in a similar sense with Debo Samuel, right? 
his versatility is so valuable to us as an offense in my opinion more than any other team in the league because of the way he uses it will that that value and that versatility be as needed with Trey Lance maybe maybe not that remains to be seen but still his value to this scheme and this team is off the charts it's it it demands the way we look at him the same way Miami looked at Tyreek Hill or Oakland looked at Devontae Adams. That's all. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and at the, one of the things that I, I do worry about too, uh, one of the big things that we know in football we, that we speak about all the time is locker room culture. And when you have guys in your locker room that are positive contributors to that culture, um, I don't think it sends a good message if you trade them. Now, I, I'm sure all of these guys they understand the business aspect of it, but how will that affect the morale of this team when, you know, I've, I've heard it, you know, on other shows, uh, Breezy and I talked about it. Debo's the guy that's leading the team out of the locker room. It's him and it's Trent Williams. And as those two guys go, this team goes. And we saw that all last year. Um, so trading a guy like that, what does that do to the morale of your football team in this locker room? So, uh, again, we got to find a way to get it done. All right, so let's pull this draft screen up. Uh, I'm going to use PFF today. Uh, we can still do trades, but uh, we'll go straight through. We won't do any trades. We'll select the 49ers. We don't have a first round pick. So let's just go right in. Let's start the draft. We can scroll back and take a look at who's been taken once we get to our pick at 61. Okay. So now we're here on the board at 61. Some of the best available. Uh, Brian Osmoa, linebacker from Oklahoma. Linebacker Troy Anderson from Montana State. Edge rusher Kingsley and Igbari from South Carolina. Wide receiver Jalen Tober from South Alabama and safety Nick Cross from Maryland are the top five best available. Uh, we know our needs. They have our needs listed here as guard, center, cornerback. Maybe we're looking for another wide receiver. Um, so where do you want to go with this first pick here at 69? Uh, what are you thinking? What are your thoughts? I think you have to, in my opinion, you, you have to go with safety. Okay. Um, and I, I go with, I would go with Nick Cross. And I know there's been, it's a little bit of a controversial pick, um, but I, I really believe that secondary still needs a boost simply because in my opinion, uh, Hafunga is not a starter. Okay. Um, and you know they've it, it's clear that the team is moving on from Jaquaski Tart um but I say that you know knowing that Tart hasn't signed anywhere else right um so uh that'll be interesting I, I I'm, I'm really interesting to see uh, interested to see here but I'd say first and foremost we consider safety so that would be my my first uh pick here uh would be safety so we're gonna go nick cross from maryland at 61 and then we'll move through to the third round i, I think we've seen that now i think as we get closer to the draft a lot of teams are going to wait on some of those uh veteran safeties because we've seen tyron matthew hasn't got a deal anywhere yet um uh apparently earl thomas is ready to to get back into football and you know he wants to play somewhere in 2022 uh you mentioned uh tart i think a lot of these teams now they're they're going to see how the draft plays out if there's one or two guys that are on their draft board if they're able to get fine you know if another team takes them and they're not able to get them and then i think they'll supplement with those veterans once the draft is over um so it is a possibility that we could bring 
tarp back in the fold but in the same situation with Debo if we're not showing him the love and like yeah you know you've been here you know you've played well for us we want you back we want you to continue to be here um if he's not seeing that from them now maybe he himself has also moved on and is deciding to you know take his talent somewhere else all right we're on the clock here at 93 uh, we've got safety taken care of with Nick Cross. Um, where do we want to go with pick 93? Um, I'd say here, you, it's probably a little bit of a reach, um, but I, I, I really believe you. Well, it depends because I haven't, I haven't seen a lot of the prospects here, but I, I personally think you need to go center here. So let's take a look at what we have at an interior. Um, so some of the centers that are on the board would be Luke Fortner from Kentucky. Um, he's ranked 105. Um, so here at 93, I don't think Luke Fortner would be a reach at this particular point. Um, Josh Williams from UNC Pembroke. Um, any other centers on the board? Uh, further down the list, we have Alec Lindstrom from Boston College. Um, uh, he's one of the players that I watch. He does have position versatility. Um, he can play both guard spots and center. Um, Luke Wattenberg from Washington, if you wanted to get a guy later. Um, but if you're looking at center, I would say Luke Fortner here at 93 would not be a bad choice. I think that's where you go. Okay. Um, you know, reading quotes from Alex Mack when he was part of the Falcons, uh, uh, his backup that we used for a while here in San Francisco, who started in the Super Bowl that we were in, all will tell you, you know, uh, and, and even I've, I've read quotes from uh, uh, from uh, uh, the, the the starting quarterback in Atlanta um, it, that center is one of the most important positions in the 49ers offense because they make the line calls. Uh, the quarterback does not make the line calls in this team. Um, so you need to have someone not just talented, but smart uh, and able to hold, hold, pre predict pre predictions, read uh, pre-snap what's happening, and be able to have the talent to help coordinate some serious uh, uh, protection schemes against some of the better interior talent that we'll see playing opposed to this team in the league. You know, Aaron Donald is in our division. Uh, and, and I know we take it for granted uh, that Brunskill can handle him. Uh, but at the same time, we just don't play Aaron Donald. You know, we, we see a lot of interior talented defensive teams in our conference still. Yes, the quarterbacks may be gone, but I don't see those interior defensive linemen uh, going anywhere anytime soon in, in, in this conference. So we're going to need a center. Line. Absolutely. And I think you can get a center now. And if Alex Mack does come back, I think that it'll be the best situation because whoever we get will have at least one year to sit in the same meeting rooms with this guy to, to learn what he needs to look for, to understand how to make the calls in this offense. So I think you can get a guy like Luke Fortner here from Kentucky. Uh, Alex Mack can take him under his wing, you know, train him up, you know, get him, you know, up to speed with the Kyle Shanahan offense, how to make the calls, what to look for. Um, so I think that would be, you know, valuable from that standpoint. Um, and you mentioned Aaron Donald. It took Aaron Donald three games to finally figure us out. And unfortunately, that third game was the NFC Championship game, and it didn't happen until the fourth quarter. <laughs> but that's why Aaron Donald is who Aaron Donald is. Uh, he's going to figure it out at some point. But I believe this season in particular, uh, it was that help from Alex Mack, making those line calls, getting everybody in position that we were able to keep Aaron Donald at bay for a little bit. But again, the great player he is, he figured it out. So we'll take Luke Fortner here at number 93 in the third round. And then we are on the clock with the last pick of the third round, pick 105. So let me know where you want to go here. Uh, I say we go uh, fourth round. We're looking at 
in my opinion, a wide receiver. Okay. And we're looking at a speed wide receiver. Uh, we're looking at someone who can take the top off of the defense. We're looking for someone who is who has that four 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 three speed, um, but has decent enough route running skills and hands to for for a defense to take seriously uh, and not just run clear out routes, but someone who can threaten. Uh, and as I know, this draft is deep in wide receivers. Um, so th this is where we need someone with a really fast 40 time. So if we're looking for that, that eliminates Kyle Phillips from UCLA because I think he ran like a four six. Um, but in that realm, we have Danny Gray from SMU, Kevin Austin Jr. from Notre Dame, uh, Eric Izukama from Texas Tech, Bo Melton from Rutgers, who ran a 4-3 and some change. There's Tyquan Thornton from Baylor, who ran a 4-2-6. Bellis Jones Jr. from Tennessee. So we got a, a few guys here. Maybe a few, maybe a reach at this point, you know, due to the rank that they're listed. But um, if we look at rank and average draft position, there are a few guys here who um, would make sense at 105, being it's the last pick in the third round and we're moving into the fourth. Um, if I had my pick, mm -hmm. you know, of course it would be Tyquan Thornton with that 426. But one of the things that you do worry about, what you mentioned, is that route run and good enough hands. Does he play yeah. that fast to where his speed will make teams respect it? Um, because it's, it's not just speed, it's it's speed, it's route running, and it's the ability to catch the ball. Um, I like a Bo Melton. I like Velas Jones Jr. I even like Kevin Austin Jr. from Notre Dame. Um, so if any of those names stick out to you, you let me know um, and we can take him here at 105. Um, and I wouldn't also be opposed to trading out of this pick to trade down. Okay, we do have uh, one trade. Uh, and it's Green Bay. If we trade down a couple spots. Let me see what it is. Can I see what the trade is? I don't know why I can't. It looks like I, we have one trade that somebody is offering us, but I can't see what that is. But if, if say if, if you wanted to trade back, we're at 105. How many spots down would you want to trade back? And we can find out where that team is and see if we can make something happen. Um, I'd say we trade back maybe six picks, seven picks. Uh, to where we are getting where that wide receiver place isn't so much of a reach okay so that would either be 111 with the jets or 112 with the giants uh i think the jets would be willing to do business but they're also looking for a wide receiver at that spot they would be so i'd say we probably need to trade back, but need to pick before the Jets. So how about a trade with Baltimore? Okay, so 110 with Baltimore. We want 110. We'll give them 105. And then what else do we want in return? Do we want, let's see. They won't give us 128. They won't give us 139. They won't give us 141. They may give us 196. Okay. That worked. All right. So that trade was accepted. We moved back from 105 to 110. And we'll resume the draft. All right. So now we're on the clock at 110. And all of the same wide receivers are still here. Okay. So I think that that I think that's a better spot to take. Um, uh, you said Josh, you said you didn't say Josh Johnson. 
Josh Johnson is here from Tulsa. Okay. Um, I would consider him here. Okay. So Josh Johnson at 110 wide receiver. Or even, from Tulsa. Or even, or even Romeo Davis, whoever ran the fastest 40 times. Okay. Or plays fast. All right. So we got Josh Johnson at 110. And now we're on the clock at 134. Uh, quarterback. <laughs> it's one of my favorite position groups this year. Uh, so we got the speedster, Kalen Barnes from Baylor. He ran the fastest 40 of anybody. I think he was 4 2 3. Got Kobe Bryant from Cincinnati here. Josh Joe from Alabama. Jalen Watson from Washington State. Uh, Deron Bland from Fresno State. The Caleb Evans from Missouri. Darion Kendrick from Georgia, Sean Jolly from Appalachian State, Mario Gilbert from Clemson, Josh Thompson from Texas, Isaac Taylor Stewart from USC. Oh, we got a bunch of guys here. I, me, me personally, I lean more towards Kobe Bryant. Um, if you want speed, obviously, Kalen Barnes is here. Are you looking for a guy who can play mainly outside? Are you looking for an inside slot corner? Let me know what you're looking for. Um. Hmm, that's a good one. I think we're we're, and I presume Kalen doesn't play the slot. Um, I think he's he's six foot one eighty three. He's running a four two three. Um, you probably could potentially put him in the nickel, but I, he's he's going to be more an outside corner with with that speed that he has, that makeup speed. He's going to be more of an outside corner he, he definitely needs to develop a little bit um but what was his what was his cone drill time uh let me see I'm or, or even up. his spark i'm curious let's see I should have closed the door to the studio. I don't know if you could hear your little cousins making all that noise downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> you have an army now, man. Oh, my goodness. We went to uh, um, King of Pressure Mall what, yesterday, uh -huh. and it was absolute madness. <laughs> absolute madness. Just like trying to keep up with them. And the baby was cool for a little bit, but then she was like, all right, I'm tired of this. <laughs> Let's see. Do we have uh, pro day numbers? Uh, he didn't do it at the combine. He only did the 40 at the combine. And I'm looking up pro day numbers. And I'm not finding uh, three cone or shuttle numbers. Let me see. Okay, wait. So three cone was 744. 20 yard shuttle was four, five, eight. And broad jump was 11, one vertical jump of 40. So I mean, with the four, two, three, 40, uh, 40 inch vertical jump, 11, one broad. He's definitely got the explosion. Mm -hmm. uh, let me see, what's his 10 yard split of one, five flat. And then 20 yard split of 252 in that 40 yard dash. What was this? I'm sorry, what was the shuttle time on? Uh, what was the shuttle time that he had with, with, with the, I guess, cone drill, which was really about the shuttle? Uh, 20 yard shuttle was uh, 4.58 seconds. And then in the three cone drill, it was 7.44 seconds. Interesting. They have him listed as six foot, but he's like 5'11 and a quarter. So yeah. he's not really a full six foot. Mm. Yeah, I. I, I... I'd say you're really looking for at this cornerback position someone who can play who can play nickel uh, or someone you can develop to play nickel who does have some sort of speed 
The reason why I'm, I'm concerned about this position a lot is because teams right now are killing us in the slot. Mm -hmm. Killing us in the slot. And when uh, K1 Williams wasn't on the field, we felt it yep. in the receiving game. So, uh, and, and, and he was not just a, a really good cover out of the slot, but run support. He was outstanding. Uh, people don't really, the, the, what we were able to do on defense, a lot of that play came from our, at least the next level, came from our secondary. Jimmy Ward knows how to tackle. Kwan Williams knows how to tackle. Jaquaswi Tart knows how to tackle. <laughs> And the type, the style of defense that uh, we call requires our guys not only to have great coverage skills in short spaces, particularly in slot, but also have run support. So, man, I, I, I love the speed, but I, I'm, I'm also, I also know that the, the, we need to be able to functionally stop or at least slow down the Cooper Cups of the world, uh, who do most of their damage from the slot. Right. So you tell me, is it Barnes? <laughs> is it Bryant? Is it um, a Darion Kendrick from Georgia? A Mario Goodrich from Clemson? Maybe some of those guys from, you know, Darion Kendrick, SEC school. Um, so you know he's seen it. Uh, Mario Goodrich from Clemson, ACC, playing in those big games. Maybe a, a Josh Job from Alabama. I, I feel like at this position, if you get him in the fourth round at 134, um, if they can come in and start right away, great. But I think they are going to be a developmental player. Somebody who you're going to have to really put some time and energy into, yeah. um, especially if you want them to play in that nickel role, um, to be able to play it, you know, maybe not the same way that K1 did, but it, to at least get the same results, um, you know, that K1 did. So you're going to have to allow them to, you know, build up to that in your defense. So you let me know where where you want to go. And I'm, I'm going to go with Josh Joe. Okay, cool. Josh Joe from Alabama at 134. And now back on the clock here in the fifth round, pick 172. Got four teams interested in a trade. Who are those teams? Buffalo. New Orleans, New England, and Miami are the four teams that are interested. Um, and so, who's and who's on the board? Okay, uh, some of the top players on the board right now: center uh, Joshua Williams from UNC Pembroke, guard Joshua uh, Izudu from North Carolina. Uh, running back Tyler Algier from BYU, tight end Daniel Bellinger from San Diego State, his teammate Zachary Thomas, tackle from San Diego State, uh, running back Brian Robinson Jr. from Alabama, guard Lasita Smith from Virginia Tech, and running back Zaquandre White um, from South Carolina. Those are the top available. Still got Ty Chandler from North Carolina here as well. Linebacker Micah McFadden from Indiana. Is there any, is there a, a position group you want to attack here or um, is it still best available? Um, who are the top running backs that are on the board? So there's Algier uh, from BYU, Robinson from Alabama, White from South Carolina, Ty Chandler from North Carolina, uh, Keontae Ingram from USC, uh, Tyler Beatty from Missouri still here. Uh, a kid that I like, Devontae Price from Florida Inter International. Hassan Haskins from Michigan. Jerion Ely from Mississippi. Jerome Ford from Cincinnati. Who's the fastest of this group? Uh, I 
think Ty Chandler ran. It's too late. Shoot, I should have had my iPad up here because I have my whole. Um, I had my whole uh, draft spreadsheet. Um, let me see. I think Ty Chandler ran like a four three four. Oh, wrong screen. Pull that up. Pull that up. He ran a four three eight five eleven two oh four. Ty Chandler ran a four three eight. Um, he's probably going to be one of the fastest. Uh, Devontae Price from Florida International, also in that 4-3 range. Um, yeah, of this group, I would say it would be Ty Chandler. Um, and one of the things that I've learned about Ty Chandler through this draft process is he has the speed. He has that 4-3 speed, uh, but he also is really, really good catching the ball out of the backfield. Um, I said we know. go with Mr. Chandler. Okay, here we go. Ty Chandler from North Carolina. Here at 172. And then uh, back on the clock here at 187. And then we're on the clock again in nine picks at 196. Um, we go, I said we go guard, best player available. I think we go we take a guard here. No, I'm sorry. Let's look at uh yeah, we take a guard here. So we got uh Joshua Zuda from North Carolina, Jason Poe from Mercer, Josh Seals from Oklahoma State, Ben Brown from Mississippi, Harry Miller from Ohio State. Uh based on this uh this ranking. Joshua Izuda from North Carolina. Let me just see what his measurements is. 64308. Okay, so we know Kyle Shanahan doesn't like offensive linemen over 325. He likes them anywhere between 305 and 320, 325. Um, so he fits that mold. Um he can play, split he can, time. Yep, and he split time. So he can play yep. swing. Yeah, he can play Definitely. swing if we need him to, and that lets you know if he played left tackle and guard that he has that athleticism. Um, this profile reads just like Daniel Brunsville. So we want to go with Izuda here. Yeah. I like it. Cool. Back on the clock at 196. Um, I'm looking at a blocking tight end, a good, a pretty good one. Um, I know that sounds. Like it's trivial, but we <laughs> really don't have one. <laughs> uh, you know, the, the 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 tight ends that we have behind that, that are starting behind uh, Kittle, you know, are either pass catchers or they're not very good blockers. So mm -hmm. uh, I think we're looking for a really good blocking tight end. Um, let's look at Connor Hayward. Now, does his size? Uh, he's too small in this. Yeah, offense. he's 5'11", 233. So he's going to be more of like that H back role. Right. Um, I would I would like a Connor Hayward. You seeing what he's been able to do. I would like Connor Hayward. Maybe if we picked him up a little bit later as yeah. an eventual replacement for Kyle Juszczyk. Yes, I knew that's where you were going. I agree with that. So, I mean, we could get him here at 196, or we can wait. I think we have, what, two? We have 220 and 221. So, I mean, it's still a possibility that we can get him later on. And then we have 262, which I don't think is correct, but we'll rock with it for this one. Um, so, we got four picks left. We could either take Hayward now or we can wait. Do you want it? Would you want to take two tight ends? Would you want to get Hayward for what he can do in that H back Kyle Juszczyk role and still get a blocking tight end? 
Um, that's a possibility. Uh, okay. But th- let's see what can we go back to the the top players on the board list. Actually, I should just bring this up myself. So. All right, so we got uh, the tackle Zachary Thomas from San Diego State. We've got uh, Brian Robinson from Alabama, running back. Zaquandre Wright, another White, another running back. Defensive lineman Curtis Brooks. Jason Poe, guard from Mercer. Linebacker Micah McFadden from Indiana. I say, let's take a tackle here. Okay, offensive yep. tackle. Yep, right there, the Zachary, your first one. The Zachary Thomas tackle. from San Diego yep. State. Yeah. Okay. Zachary Thomas at 196. And now we have back to back picks at 220 and 221. And um, you can go safety, linebacker. Edge rusher. If you want to wow, see if there's an edge there, edge in this draft. We have not yet. And of this list, the only one that I'm a fan of is Jeffrey Gunter from Coastal Carolina. What's his uh what's his what's his profile? 6'2, 258. So he's like D forward profile. Yeah. 6'2, 258. Uh, he's about to be 23 soon. Redshirt senior, Coastal Carolina. Um, let me pull up his. Uh... It's going to be hard. See, the way I see Edge right now, unless unless it's the top pick or, or one of our top picks, it's going to be hard to make this team at, at Edge. Yeah. Um, cause we've done really well, I guess, in free agency of picking up those, you know, dudes who didn't necessarily pan out on other teams who kind of fell through the cracks. And we know what Chris Pusarek can do Yep. with linemen, particularly edge as rushers. And I feel like Kerry Hyder is going to have a bounce back season yeah. uh, because he had a solid season with us in 2020. You know, use that to get a, a, a decent contract from the Seahawks, goes to the Seahawks and does absolutely nothing. Um, so then I, now I feel like he's going to come back and I think he has something to prove. I think yeah. he has something to prove to say, you know, last year was an anomaly um, or, you know, I, I bet on myself. I went to another team for the contract but they weren't a fit. This is the fit. This is where I need to be. This is the coach that I need to be under. Um, and you can see that I'm still able to produce. I, I feel like he has something to prove, which is going to be a huge benefit for us as a football and, team. And so. keep your eye on Ture this year. Kamiko Ture, from, yeah. From the Colts. That has been an underrated signing. Very much so. Keep your eye on that. that yep. That's that, I, I agree with you. I think a lot, a, a lot of the faithful m- are football fans, but from a Niners perspective, and they right. don't see the the landscape of the entire NFL. Um, he's been able to sustain a, a pretty consistent and solid career, and now I think he comes to this team with, you know, the the, the tutelage and, and the coaching of a Chris Kosarek, and knowing that teams are actively putting two or three guys on Nick Bosa every play. Every play. So if I'm an edge rusher, I want to be in San Francisco. I want to be in places like Pittsburgh. I want to be in Cleveland because I know if I'm not the number one guy, I'm going to have one-on-ones a majority of every game that I step on the field because they're focusing their attention on the Miles Garrett's on the TJ Watts and on the Nick Bosa's. And for him to still be able to put up 15 and a half sacks, commanding all of that attention. Yeah. And, and that's why a lot of these other guys on the team, they have to step up and they have to produce 
because if he's still getting 15 and a half sacks, getting double and triple teams consistently, and on top of getting double and triple teams, getting hell, let's just throw that out there. Not saying that as a biased 49er fan, like there is anecdotal evidence every game of him being hell, and he doesn't complain about it. That's the one thing that I, I love about Nick Bosa. He doesn't complain about it. He might say, yeah, you know, they didn't call it, but that's part of the game. But he's not actively complaining and going on, you know, Instagram rants and, and, and going on ESPN and NFL Network saying, you know, I just wish I get the call. He's going out there and he's still being able to produce. So some of these other guys got to step up. So I agree. Maybe we don't go edge in this entire draft, because like you said, if we don't get one early, if we don't get one round two or three, then anybody later, it's going to be really tough for them to make this roster. So where where would you want to go here um, at 220 and 221? We got back to backs. Um, I I also like defensive line or, or defensive tackle, defensive tackle here. Who do you like in this group? In this group, um, I like Noah Ellis from Idaho. I like Marquand McCall from Kentucky, um, and that's probably about it. Uh, uh, no, I, I'd go with Ellis. Yep, he's more of a nose. Yeah, six but that's four, okay. three forty six. That's okay. Yeah. So we'll go Noah Ellis from Idaho. Yeah, because I I, I think we need a development player here, talented development player. Um. I think you're going to have to platoon what's happening because I'm not completely convinced that um, that we're set here after losing my boy DJ Jones. Yeah. That I hurt. Agree. That, that hurt a lot. Jones is one of my favorite players. That, <laughs> that hurt a lot. That hurt a lot. And like I, I was I was really leaning into like the DJ Jones lookalike thing. <laughs> like I was I was like pushing to have him on the show and it's like me and him just chop it up. Like we <laughs> both love barbecue. Like we got that aspect together. Like And he went to Temple. Didn't he go to Temple? Uh I'm not sure. No, I don't think he went to Temple. That was a uh, that was Julian Taylor. Okay. DJ Jones, where did he go? Uh college, 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 college. Ole Miss. Ole Miss, that's right. Yeah. All right, so we going Noah Ellis at 220? Yeah. Okay. Noah Ellis at 220. Uh, get some help on that interior of the defensive line. Now we're on the clock at 221, and then we have one more pick at 262. Uh, I'd say uh, we're looking at I, – I know this sounds crazy, but – Maybe special teams again here. Um, you like know, kicker, Robbie, or, kicker or punter? I'm thinking kicker. Robbie is not getting any younger. Okay, so <laughs> there's there's <laughs> there's the the kid from Texas who everybody loves his name. Uh, there's Cameron Dicker, Dicker the kicker. He's here. Uh, Jake uh, Camarda from Georgia, um, but this kid Matt Ariza from San Diego State is is a special one uh, because he can also place kick. Interesting. They have him listed as a punter, but he can also place kick, um, and apparently he is just as effective as a place kicker. Six one two hundred. Uh, the kid has got a boot, uh, but do you draft him? Not necessarily knowing if he can be an effective place kicker and make that transition from punter to full time place kicker. Um, I, I, I mentioned this before on, on Nitty Gritty Niners. I don't know why they haven't found a, a do it all kicker yet to where you wouldn't have to use two roster spots. Like if all you're doing is kicking the ball, why can't you? place kick and punt at the same time like um, i don't know if, if i if i loved to do that and if that's what i wanted to do i would figure out how to be good at both to make a team say look you don't need two of these guys i can i can place kick and i can punt for you 
Uh, I, I think it, again, this comes to how this 49ers front office thinks about, in my opinion, there's just a little bit of ego involved, right? Yep. I think Wisniewski has been okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and the the problem is we drafted him in the fourth round of the tip of yep. which everyone agrees was way too high. Yep. Um, and he's just been okay. I, I, I think, I don't know. I think you you have to bring in competition here if you're serious, really serious about improving special teams. That's kind of how I look at it. And then someone who can potentially place kick too. Um, let's see. Let's do it. Matt Arise at two twenty one. I love it. I I love it. I'm 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 actually really really cool with that. I think. The, the competition aspect that you mentioned, you know, let's see, because what we heard from uh, about Wisnowski, especially with, the, you know, the the rugby experience and, and all that other stuff is that he knows how to kick the ball and he could put certain spins on the ball and it makes it difficult. You know, I, I've seen a few fumbles from punt and kick returners, but not to the, the clip that they said that we would see them. Like, I haven't seen punt returners have that much difficulty with fielding his kicks um so yeah bringing in that competition is uh i think it, it, it's a great thing that we can do for this team all right we've got the last pick in the draft in this particular mock simulation here at 262 um who do you want to bring in at this point best player available we have quarterback brock purdy from iowa state safety marquise bell who actually i really like from florida a m um caleb ellaby quarterback from western michigan Snoop Connor, running back from Mississippi. Austin Deckless, tackle from LSU. Ryan Stonehouse, punter from Colorado State, but we already got that. Uh, Nephi Sewell, linebacker from Utah, uh, who I also think he may be coming and help us on special teams. Yeah, that's where, I think that's where we go. Nephi Sewell from Utah? Yeah, yeah. Boom. So now we are getting a grade for our draft. Uh, no, you're not getting any money for me. All right, let's take a look at what we're able to do. So second round, pick 61, we take safety Nick Cross from Maryland. Third round pick 93, we take center Luke Fortner from Kentucky. Uh, we traded back from 105 and picked up 110 and 196. At 110, we take uh, wide receiver Josh Johnson from Tulsa. Um, at 134, we take cornerback Josh Joe from Alabama. At uh, round five, pick 172, we take running back Ty Chandler from North Carolina. Round six, pick 187, we take Joshua Izudu from North Carolina. We got an A-plus for that pick. And then nine picks later at 196, we got an A-plus for taking tackle Zachary Thomas. Um, and round six, pick 220, we take defensive tackle Noah Ellis. Um, in round six, 221, the very next pick, we take punter Matt Ariza from San Diego State. And then in round seven, pick 262, we take linebacker Nephi Sewell from Utah. So all in all, uh, we got an overall B for this particular draft, which I think is pretty solid. We address safety. We address offensive line three times. We get a center guard and a tackle. Continue to bring in that uh, competition. We bring in another wide receiver in the building with the mindset that Debo Samuel will still be on this team. Yeah. We cornerback to add to the room. Hopefully, we can train him up to to play well in our nickelback position. Uh, we got another running running back. We suffered injuries all across that running back room. Um, so maybe we can find some health and some consistency with Ty Chandler. He has the speed. He can catch the ball out of the backfield. Um, and then we bring in help on the defensive line with Noah Ellis. Uh, Matt Ariza, competition um, in our special teams as far as kicking. And then Nephi Sewell, depth at linebacker and special teams. So that is the draft. Um, that is our mock draft for the San Francisco 49ers. Again, with all the elephants in the room, we don't know what's going to happen. 
Um, Cuz, I appreciate you coming on. Let, uh, let's get your final thoughts um, and then we can get the folks on out of here. Yeah, I, I feel like the team, um, even though they probably don't want to admit it as much, is probably going through, I won't say a complete rebuild, let's say retool it. Uh, some of their players are just kind of aging out of the process. We forget that Kyle and John has been have been sort of guiding this team for already what six seasons now, seven seasons. So, um, you know, if this was a college program, we'd already have seniors who have moved through and moved on. Um, so uh, I feel like you know, given the way deals are written, um, you know, you get that first deal, uh, you get the the uh, uh, developmental uh, uh, progress of a player and then they show it on the field or not. Uh, and if they've shown well on the field uh, and they're a role player uh, and we're still trying to get that elusive championship, likely they'll be overpaid. That's part of the NFL system uh, that's that's out there and they may move on or they may, may stay. Uh, as, as long as you know, I believe we're being honest with the talent we have on the team. As long as we're being honest about the big questions that are happening on the offensive line, for me, that drives not only uh, the offensive production, but how many snaps you keep away from the opposing defense. You know, I always look at offense sustainability, offense production as just as much of a, a player on defense as a player on defense, right? Um, so so uh, I, I feel like if we go into the season eyes wide open as a front office, as a fan base, knowing these questions exist, keep Debo, I'm in the keep Debo camp, um, then, then I think the, the, the 2022 season should be okay. Um, the draft will help us again deal with some of those question marks we have. I don't think we have a lot of question marks going into the draft, uh, which is why I'm completely against adding yet another one by trading people. Absolutely. That's going to do it. That's going to wrap it up for this mock draft for the San Francisco 49ers. Uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. I greatly appreciate your time and attention. Sound off in the comment section. Let us know what you like, what you didn't like, what you would have done differently with this 49er mock draft. Again, there's there's a bunch of different options that we have at our feet. Some will love, some will hate. Uh, but in everything, we will remain faithful as 49er fans. You can uh, get in contact with me on all of my social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok. I'll leave a link in the description for all of those platforms. If this is your first time here at Mo's Knows, again, thank you for your time and attention. Greatly appreciate it. Uh, do a few favors before you head on out. Enjoy the rest of your day. One, smash that thumbs up button. I greatly appreciate it. Two, become a part of the Mo's Knows fam. Like I told you in the beginning, once your family, I love you. There's nothing you can do about it. Acid, that's my real cousin. That's my real family. We love each other and there's nothing that either of us can do about it. So that'll be the same thing for you. Same thing for you. So smash that subscribe button and take another two seconds and hit that bell icon so that you get notified every time new content drops right here at Mo's Nose. Again, appreciate y'all. Catch y'all on episode 31.